OK, everybody, let's call this meeting to order. We keep being told that the NHS has a problem, deep crisis. Now, of course, we all have private health care, so none of us have any personal experience of this. But let's give it a go sorting it out. Strategy meeting team consisting of myself, Steve Barclay, Member of Parliament, Healthcare Secretary, um, some civil servants and uh, you at the back. Who are you? I'm Gregory, sir. I'm doing some work experience. Okay, Gregory, thanks for joining us today. So what we want is we want to harness the potential of whole body care. Do you mean like pedigree chums, sir? No, I want you to think bigger. Blue sky thinking. Exactly what are the barriers? Money? Morale? Workforce? Silos! That's right, Gregory. Silos. Greater emphasis on general medical skills to complement existing deep specialist expertise. That's what we need. Um, a couple of problems, sir. We don't have enough GPs. Well, where the bloody hell have they all gone? They're all still here, but they reckon they can't do more than three days a week because it's all so stressful and they're all burned out. And oh, while we're at it, we don't really have enough specialists. Where the hell are they? You see, they've all been paying out of their eyeballs in tax because of their pension. So they've um, just retired and taken their pension. They do a lot of volunteering now. At the hospital, big society and all that. No, sir, we really need to pay people to work in the NHS. No, sir, they go and do stuff in the Hedgehog Rescue Centre. Hedgehogs are having a pretty bad time of it as well at the moment. Well, then let's focus on preventative medicine. Stop people getting sick. Which part of the NHS looks after public health? Well, that would be public health, but we did decide that they shouldn't be part of the NHS anymore. So, okay, don't worry. Just get the GPs to do it. Add something else into quaff or all the other stuff that we get them to do that's basically quaff, but we pretend it isn't by calling it a different three letter acronym. Okay, back to the whole person care. Brainstorm. Start at the top. Um... Timothy, two in one. It's got a nice conditioner in it. No, I mean ideas. I need better ideas. How can I save the NHS with all the doctors retiring early or going off sick because they feel a bit sad? Good news, sir. We've almost reached the point where there's not enough working GPs to sign the sick ones off. So they're going to have to come back to work and we should reach equilibrium very soon. Use the app. Gregory, great idea. Let's give it a go. Beep, 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 beep. It's telling me that I have to go to A&E. I didn't even know I was sick. Oh, don't worry, sir. It says that to everyone. It'll even call you an ambulance automatically now. It's telling me the indicative wait time is two weeks. I think it might be faster to get a GP appointment. Hang on a second. I've got a great idea. GPs could do whole body care instead of A&E. What we need is generalist medical skills to complement deep specialist expertise. I think we might be going round in circles, sir. Don't worry. Write it down, call it the NHS Major Condition Strategy, and we'll make the rest up later. It's Friday, the 27th of January, 2023, and this is the Hot Topics Podcast. Thanks for joining us once again on the Hot Topics podcast from MB Medical. As usual, Neil Tucker here to take you through the next 15 or 20 minutes or so, having a look at what's going on in the world of news and research for general practice. And I know what you're thinking. It's about time, Neil. The last podcast was weeks and weeks and weeks ago. Yep, you've got me. It's been really, really busy. This week, we've just signed off on the new Hot Topics book. We'll have the new course coming out at the start of March. We'll be doing a webinar. Then do have a look at the mbmedical.com website for that. In the meantime, we've got our current Hot Topics course that's coming on tomorrow. So this weekend, we've also got our women's health course coming up next weekend. We've got a free clinic on the 7th of February. That's a Tuesday evening at 8 o'clock on health inequalities in cancer. And then on the 11th of February, we've got our mental health course. There's loads going on. 
If you're new to the podcast, if you're new to MB Medical, then do check out MB Plus, our subscription service. For just over £300 a year, you get access to all of the courses that we do. We do more than 10 different courses online now. Um, multiple times throughout the year. Also, safeguarding material, we'll be building more on that this year as well. We've got online learning modules and loads more. Do check it out. Now, this podcast is meant to be lighthearted and entertaining. I'll let you make up your mind if the latter is true. It's felt a little bit difficult sometimes to do the former, given the fact that things are really tough in general practice at the moment. So I think it is worth just acknowledging that if you've had a tough few weeks, you are not alone. As a result, a number of different medical bodies have um, come out and released statements to acknowledge this fact. Like the GMC, it says it acknowledges that things are... Okay, so when I'm preparing the podcast, I normally write down a plan of what I'm going to talk about. And I make a few little notes, which I've I've done in this case with the GMC quote. I know that it's not a direct quote from them because I've wrote down, it acknowledges that things are S-H-I-T. Now, I'm spelling that out because if I swear on the podcast, then I have to click a button that says it's got explicit material in it. And while I'm sure we all feel like swearing a lot at the moment... We probably don't need that on the podcast in case you're listening to this in your kitchen and the kids are in the background. Plus, I feel like it's just a failure of my vocabulary. I've digressed. So the GMC acknowledges that things are bad at the moment, but it wags its finger and says, don't let standards slip, you rascals. Don't do it. And then the CQC will only be inspecting practices with the highest level of concern where they think there's genuine risk to patients. It seems to me that given the current struggles with workforce and over overburden, pretty much all practices have an increased risk to patients at the moment. But anyway, they I guess they've got a really high bar at the moment, the CQC. I guess this is welcome news for most of us. Uh, but be warned, it's only till March. After that, presumably, if you've let things slip in the months where they wouldn't be inspecting, then they're still going to crush your balls in a vice. Meanwhile, news reports say the NHS can't recruit junior staff because supermarkets pay better. So integrated care boards are trying to counter their inability to pay higher wages with well-being apps. Now, I don't think you have to be a brain surgeon to work out that if a job needs you to have a well-being app, that you probably shouldn't touch it with a barge pole. What's the solution? Well, there are obviously no easy solutions. You and I know that. The political parties have to be seen to be doing something. And the big surprise over the last few weeks is that Labour, which I think probably a lot of GPs thought would be the saviour of general practice and the NHS in general, has come out with some very radical ideas about what they would do if they got into power at the next general election. And the biggest news for us is that they would consider phasing out GP partnerships. Now, those of you who are regular listeners to the podcast will know that this is an idea that I am not entirely adverse to. I think there are lots of positives to that. My wife, who is a GP partner, has slightly different views on this. And while I admire Labour for thinking progressively, I'm sure that they don't appreciate the level of extra work the level of commitment that partners put in to their partnerships, their practices and their patients, that they will go above and beyond and that there is no signing off at at 6.30. So as well as thinking about what you might save, you have to think about what you are going to lose if you change the system. And I still believe that the fundamental problem with general practice, the reason so many people leave, so many people get burnout, is because of the intensity of the day. And that's what's got to be addressed. Eek! We're almost nine minutes into the podcast. I haven't even mentioned about the research. Let's get on with it, shall we? So three papers we're going to look at today. I thought seeing as it's our first one of the year, we'd like to have a bit of diversity in the research we're looking at. So we're going to have one randomised controlled trial. We're going to have one large cohort trial and then some qualitative research as well. Answering the questions, does molnupiravir work for acute COVID in the community? What is the relationship? relationship between healthy lifestyle and cognitive decline? And lastly, what do our patients think about fit tests now that we're using them more and more? Okay, first let's look at this Molnupiravir paper. This was published in The Lancet. It came out today. This is hot off the press. Good news for vulnerable patients that there are a range of acute therapies that we can use in general practice. 
or at least in the CMDUs, the COVID medicines delivery units, there's three or four options, one of which is called molnupiravir. This is the this was the first oral antiviral medication for SARS-CoV-2 and initial NHS recommendations had it as our first line therapy. Then as more data came out, it became clear that perhaps it wasn't quite as efficacious as we hoped it would be. And even the drug company sponsored trials showed that its efficacy was around 30% or so, so really not that special. Since the start of the pandemic in the UK, we've had this big research program going called the Panoramic Trial, which has been instrumental in examining a range of different treatments to see whether they do work for community-based therapy. This was the turn of molnupiravir. So this is a UK-based, multi-centre, open-label, randomised control trial. Eligible patients were age 50 plus or 18 years and older with a relevant comorbidity with confirmed COVID for the, within the last five days managed in the community. They were randomized to either have a standard dose of molnupiravir, so 800 milligrams twice a day for five days, plus usual care or usual care alone. Almost 13,000 patients in the molnupiravir arm and then the usual care alone arm. And the results showed that there was no difference between the two groups. Rates of hospitalizations and deaths were exactly the same. The authors conclude that molnupiravir did not reduce the frequency of COVID-19 associated hospitalizations or death among high-risk vaccinated adults in the community. And that sentence has an important word in it, and that's vaccinated. So the initial trials looked at unvaccinated individuals, and it may be then for that group that there is still some benefit of molnupiravir. It's still not going to be great because the drug company data shows us that it's not that special. It may be better than nothing. That's probably also then going to be true for patients that just don't generate an antibody response despite vaccination. However, for the vast majority of vaccinated individuals, it really is going to be no better than nothing. So tough times for drug manufacturers of acute COVID treatments. Citrovimab, one of the monoclonal antibodies on the list for community um, treatment, has also been disregarded now. It's lost its efficacy with the latest variants of Omicron. But it's not all bad news. So Paxlovid, so this combination of Nermitrelvir and Ritonavir, oral antiviral therapy, some real world data showed that this was still efficacious. Although the results weren't as impressive as the initial studies on unvaccinated individuals, on vaccinated adults, they showed it still reduced hospitalizations and death by half. If we've got a patient in a very high risk group who contacts us because they've got COVID, but they haven't heard anything through the normal NHS channels about treatment, then we still want to refer them to the CMDU. While the list of what works is changing, there are still drugs that work and they could save their lives. Okay, second piece of research. This is a large cohort study just published by the BMJ this week looking at the association between healthy lifestyle and memory decline in older adults, a 10-year population-based prospective cohort study. And this was a Chinese study. Say what you want about China. Poor human rights record, totalitarian dictatorship, oppressive surveillance state. But boy, Can they do a cohort study well? The aim of this study was to identify an optimal lifestyle profile to protect against memory loss in older individuals. I think probably most of us buy into the idea that if we lead a healthy lifestyle, we don't smoke, we do some regular exercise, we try not to be overweight, then that's going to reduce our chance of getting memory impairment in the future. I guess maybe a lot of that is through an improvement in cardiovascular risk factors. But this study went the extra mile because they also looked at the apolipoprotein E allele. This is a gene that's been most commonly associated with Alzheimer's. In the paper, they described the gene as being reportedly correlated with earlier and more rapidly progressive memory decline with um, abnormally high levels of beta amyloid plaques in the brain, more rapid neurodegeneration and memory loss in those who do not have it. Um, and also magnifying the effects of other risk factors, including physical activity or physical inactivity, rather. 
unhealthy diet and smoking. For all those people out there who have spat into a tube or rubbed a rubber swab on the inside of their cheek and then sent it off for DNA testing with a commercial company, this is going to be one of the the main gene markers that they're looking for, and that'll flag them up as having risk of Alzheimer's in the future. So the results of the study showed, unsurprisingly, if you have a healthier lifestyle, you are less likely to get memory impairment in the future. And they also show a, d- a dose effect so the healthy, healthier you are, correspondingly, the, the greater reduction, the chance of you getting dementia in older age. Then we come on to this risky Alzheimer's gene. So either way, memory declined continuously over time, but that seemed to occur faster in the carriers for this APO lipoprotein E4 allele, albeit with a pretty small difference between the two groups overall. The good news is that a healthy lifestyle appears to negate the effects of the gene. So the outcomes are the same as for the non-carriers. Bad news on your 23andMe genetic test? Don't worry, just put down the donuts, fags and whiskey and you're going to be just fine. Lastly, we're going to have a look at a paper in the BJGP, big focus on cancer in their February edition. And this is a piece of qualitative research on patient experience and satisfaction with symptomatic faecal immunochemical testing. We're all doing more diagnostic fit tests these days. There have been guideline changes in England and Scotland, meaning that we're going to be using these to effectively exclude cancer rather than colonoscopies in a lot of cases. That's something that we as clinicians have to get our heads around and something that we need to find out whether patients find acceptable as well. In this study, they used Uh, mailed quantitative surveys and then semi-structured telephone interviews to try and find out what patients thought about fit tests. The good news is people like them. So satisfaction with a fit test was high at 89%. To be honest, if I was told I could rule out cancer by pooing in a pot rather than having to have a tube stuck on my bum, then I'd be pretty happy with that too. The researchers also asked about how satisfied they were with their GP consultation and with how they received their results. And the satisfaction here was not as good as with the fit test overall. So 74 and 76 percent respectively. Overall, those figures are still pretty good, but it does tell us there are things we could do better. Perhaps there are things we could learn. Regarding the consultation, the things that made people feel better about it was having a good explanation as to the purpose of the test and also knowing how long the fit test would take to arrive. Regarding receiving the results, this is a point at which the patients could feel severely let down. And the big theme to come out of it was that they wanted to receive the results from a GP. They didn't want to have to find it themselves or be given it secondhand by a receptionist. Anything else was considered unacceptable. It left them with this sense of a niggling doubt. And of course, we have to remember that we're doing this test to rule out cancer. We've, we would have clearly communicated that with our patients. And so even though it might feel like a more minor test than having a colonoscopy, the outcome from the patient's perspective is still the same. I can understand why they would be concerned. If it was a smoker with a prolonged nasty cough that I was sending off for a chest x-ray... I wouldn't do a Gregory and just tell them to look at the app. I'd be getting them back in or at least picking up the phone. The other theme that they raised was that whilst they felt reassured if the test was normal, they were still dissatisfaction that there's no diagnosis and no further follow up regarding their symptoms. And I think this is going to be the big challenge for us as we're sort of incorporating these new guidelines from NHS England, also up in Scotland. It's all well and good saying it isn't cancer. But what is it? I want to know as well as the patient. And I can see that we will be doing a lot less two-week wait colonoscopies. We may be doing a lot more routine ones. All right. Thanks for joining us, everyone. I think that's enough for today. The next podcast, I promise, won't be so long away. As well as the latest news and research, we're also going to have another one of our series of just one more thing. I've interviewed Catherine Hickman, who's the current chair of the Primary Care Respiratory Society, asking her opinion about what we need to know about right now in general practice. 
As ever, you can get in contact. We're on email, so hottopics at nbmedical.com and on Twitter at GP Hot Topics. I hope you are surviving the cold and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.